Andy? Yeah. Yo. Hey. Hey, hey. We're doing it. Finally. There's a lot of build-up to this one. A lot of anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> anticipation and or disappointment. I'm kidding. I, I, I hope not because uh, I think that, you know, Protoss are obviously a really important band um, to the Northern Virginia music scene. And uh, a lot of people have really fond memories of your show. Well, that's cool. It's bizarre to think about that Protoss started 25 years ago. Yeah. This year. It's crazy how, how much time has actually gone on. Uh, this podcast actually sort of started, or part of uh, the starting of this podcast was a poster that came out celebrating uh, the 30th anniversary of, of Jam for Man. Wait. Yeah, it's, the, it's the 30th anniversary of Jam for Man this year. The first year of Jam for Man. Wait. Um, just curious, did you uh, get a chance to uh, attend any of the Jam for Man shows? No. Like, I moved I moved here when I was in here. I moved from Florida to Fairfax in 1991, like, right before the Rodney King riots. And so... It took me a while to kind of, I mean, relatively speaking, it wasn't a while, but it, it took me a while to kind of dial in to the local scene. And, you know, I went to Robinson High School and out of everyone from Robinson, there was like one other kid that liked the same exact kind of music that I liked, you know, like that was really into hardcore and it was just kind of weird. Well, then you were missing out, not uh, not moving to Reston. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Because there was a whole hardcore scene going on in, in Reston at that time. Or, may, you know, it, it was definitely um, waning by uh, the early 90s. But certainly, you know, from about... 86 to 90 were the, was, was the heyday of the rest in hardcore scene. Right. And, like, for me, it was, you know, part of, you know, I moved in the middle of 10th grade, which is an extremely difficult year when you're trying to kind of figure out who you are in life. And the way that it was in Florida, it, it, the, the schools were not set up the same. So, I did not have junior high. I had I had middle school, which was 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, and then high school was 10th, 11th, 12th. So I only had actually been in high school for a couple months, and then I moved to Robinson, which was like 5,000 people or something like that. It was just insane being around so many people and, you know, not – not really knowing, you know, you, like when you move, your infrastructure is gone, and then let alone like the only real way to connect is like to the music that I was interested in was just searching out the record stores, and that kind of you know one thing led to another. What what brought your parents to the area? What made them want to move from Florida to the DC suburbs? My so my father is a minister. He's a Southern Baptist minister, and he was approached. Uh, we he was approached in Florida to come and take over a church in Annandale, actually. And so, like we came up and visited in the fall of 1990, and I met everyone at this church. It was it was. Parkwood Baptist Church at the intersection of Rolling Road and Braddock Road, and you know there were so there's so many different schools here, and so many different kids from so many different schools. Like I just went and toured all these different schools, 
you know, Robinson, Woodson, Lake Braddock, you know, all these different places. And then you know, when, was, when we ended up moving here, it was kind of on me to figure out what, which school I was kind of leaning towards. And I liked, I liked Robinson the best. Why? <laughs> because it's super cute girl from my youth group church. That's where she attended. She went to Robinson, and I was like, I also need to go to Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's as good a reason as any. You know, like, if you have your choice, that was my choice. And the 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 irony is she and I never dated. It was just she was my, you know. Crush. <laughs> she was my crush. I mean, we're friends. I mean, we're still friends to this day, but we just never. She was she was one of those girls that always had like this one boyfriend for years. Yeah, you know, like there's like like one or two girls in school that just are constantly in a relationship with some guy from somewhere else. Like he didn't go to our school, he didn't go to our church, just some other dude, and that was her. Yeah, you didn't you didn't have a prayer there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, living on a prayer, dude. <laughs> So when you were in Florida and you were listening to, to hardcore music, were you familiar with uh, the DC scene? Dude, are you kidding? Yeah, hundred percent. I was so freaking psyched. Like so, so right before we moved, you know, we had, you know, my mom, or specifically my mom, had this talk because I lived in a very small beach town in Florida. It was called Satellite Beach, where like we could ride our bikes to school, and there was a strip mall that we could ride to. Like, everything was pretty close. But if you wanted to go to the place to get hardcore, that was on mainland, and that was a drive. You know, my parents had to drive or, a friend, you know, an older friend or something. And so my mom was like, you know, when we move up to, to, to Washington, D.C., everything's really far apart. We're going to have to drive everywhere. Um, it's just we're not going to be able to really – things are going to be really, really different. You know, we're kind of – what I was led to believe, and then she was like, we're actually moving to Fairfax County, and I was like, holy crap, that is mentioned on the screen LP. <laughs> <laughs> like, one of the, one of the like, shout-outs on the screen LP, the guy was like, you know, it's the Fairfax County Police! I was like, dude, that's where I'm moving! I called all my friends, like, dude, put on the screen LP! They yell Fairfax County, that's where I'm moving! I'm like, I thought you were going to D.C. I like, I think I am, but I think that's actually what I'm doing. <laughs> It was like this like, definitive moment. I was like, oh, dude, Scream is close to where I'm from. You know, like this, it was pretty pinnacle, but I was way in the minor threat. You know, a lot of their, I'm not going to say a lot of the early Discord stuff. Minor threat, period. You know, like, I, I remember the day, I remember the day that our school found out about Fugazi. Some, this, this like older skater dude, he looked like Anthony Kiedis from Red Hot Chili Peppers. His name was Tony, he had long hair and shirt. He was skating inside the school against the rules. He's like, dude, you guys hear this new minor threat band? I'm like, there's a new minor threat band? This is like 1989. Like, this is far beyond minor threat. And, and Fugazi had already been around for a while. He's like, dude, Fugazi, check it out. And I heard it and I was like, I hate this. <laughs> this, is not, this does not sound like minor threat or scream. What is this? He's like, dude, it's so much better. He's like, you are wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was a, you know, a super judgmental eighth grader that loved Sepultura and Creator, like, you know, thrash metal.
And so kind of coming out of that mindset of being like, if you sing, I didn't like it. It was a guitar solo. I didn't like it. It had to be fast. It had to be loud. And it had to be angry. And then moving to D.C., or, yeah, moving and starting to attend shows in D.C. and kind of discovering that there are all these scenes that are not the same. Because, in, like, in Florida, if you listen to The Misfits, you listen to Minus Threat, you listen to Fugazi, maybe you listen to, like, Dinosaur Jr. or something like that, but you listen to Op Ivy and you're prob- you, you, you could be straight edge, you know, like, all this different stuff. And then coming up here and the scenes were totally split apart it was really shocking to me to be like, oh, this is not all the same. It's different. And that was kind of my foray into all the different scenes. And it's actually a pretty interesting, I've never thought about it so right now, kind of precursor to the way Frotus operated because we didn't relegate ourselves to one specific show, like type of show. We played all kinds of stuff everywhere. Well, I think that that's true for for all of the bands from Northern Virginia. All right. Of all of, all of the bands that that I have um, that I've loved over the years and that I've talked to uh, and interviewed, um, they all have very different sounds, and then there are certain themes that run. I think more through the the ideology of the band than anything else. Well, and I, I I think too it's like you like living in the shadow of discord, not living. I mean, part of it is like living in the shadow of discord. You know, um, it, it it has to be influential, and and you know for the most part it's usually positive. Sometimes it can be super negative, like. I remember, you know, like, we are from Northern Virginia. We're not, we don't live in D.C., <laughs> you know? So it's like there's this feeling of being an outsider that most of the time it's fabricated. Like, it's self-doubt, or not self-doubt, it's like being self-conscious with yourself about not living inside the district border, you know? Like, oh, I'm, you know... I'm, you know, I'm not really a part of the scene. I just live next to it, you know? And then one of the things for me that's been so interesting, you know, 25 years later is, is to hear people speak that way to me about my old band. Like, oh, you know, we weren't really from DC like you guys. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, like, yes, like, Yes, now I live inside Washington, D.C. And yes, heard it did practice in Washington, D.C. for a long time. But whether or not we lived in Fairfax County and played in Washington, D.C., it doesn't, none of it matters. Do you know what I mean? Like, none of that matters, but like for the, maybe it's ego, maybe it's, um, want of inclusion, like, everyone always wants to be, like, oh, we're from D.C., we're from D.C., you know? Um, but then, you know, stepping back, none of it, it doesn't matter at all where you're from. It's like, where do you perform? And, like, at the end, like, when bands get really active, people are like, oh, well, you know, how often do you play home? Like, we play in D.C. once a year. We play D.C. just as much as we play Los Angeles or whatever, you know? Like, like things of Things evolve. And most of the guys from those bands weren't from D.C. anyway. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Uh, all the, all the bands that people think of as D.C. bands, they're from different, you know, suburbs and places around D.C. for the most part. Right. And, and again, it's like, I think part of it is just like playing music, being... Yeah, it, it is super intimidating to be in a band and then, like, oh, who's your local band? It's Fugazi and Jawbox. Like, oh, oh, <laughs> I've heard of them. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're kind of forced into the shadow of these living, like, living legends, essentially. And it can go one of two ways. Like, you can either kind of, you know, it, it makes you, like, kind of craft your own identity or you fall into being, you know, you kind of, 
playing into the, trying to to be assimilated by a group. And and one of one of the things that you know it took me a long time. It's like it's not like these are like because I mean you know back in the day, DC had this like legendary, infamous uh, reputation of being totally snotty and and you know not caring and being really really pretentious and everything else. And, like, getting older as an adult, I don't think that was the case at all. I think D.C., the D.C. music scene is, was mostly made of incredibly introverted individuals. You know? like And people who were very, um, you know, I mean, they're very inclusive or wanted to include, like, the kids and create an atmosphere that was accepting of all kinds of different people and, you know, doing stuff that was socially conscious, too. Yeah. Agreed. And so, I, you know, I think in, in a lot of respects, those bands changed the reputation of DC. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think, too, it's like once, once, um, It's weird. I've been reading the, I don't know if it's considered the oral history, but, but basically the history of straight edge. Um, and uh, it's actually a really, really interesting book in, in about like the development of the, of the movement and of the subculture and all of that. And, you know, it, you know, it starts here. It takes place here. And, and well, it's, it's, it's really interesting because, all of these bands, all these straight edge bands, are so iconic. And you know, like you know, I was I was in a straight edge band. You know, I was a battery, and we were on Revelation Records, and we're a part of that scene. But yet, there's these other bands that I have no interaction with, like SSB Control from Boston. Like they're basically attributed to like spreading the movement. And like minor threat kind of started it, you know, and it's like to hear all of the all of those guys, not specifically SSD, but like to hear these iconic bands that I've grown up listening to, basically say the same exact thing of like, yeah, we kind of felt like outsiders, and we you know did our own thing, and I was like, dude, I think that's part like that drive is what universally. Pushes bands to become who they are. You know? Well, to play music. Yeah, to play music, but to kind of find their identity inside of the collection that is their band. You know? Like, um, I don't know, I find, I, I don't know, I find that stuff really interesting. Well, so when you were in high school, um, did you have other bands? No, well, I mean, in, in Florida, I was in a hardcore band. And we see, <laughs> it was comedically called Headlock. Um, I still have the demo tape. I mean, it sounds pretty legit for being 15 years old, you know? Um, but when I moved here, like I was saying before, I, I was trying to be in a hardcore band. And there wasn't anyone at my school. And the very first person I ever played music with is in the deal. He was now the bass player for Darkest Hour. But back then, he was just like an alternative guy. So he shows up. He's got on art, like, overalls. And he's talking to me about Dinosaur Jr. And I was like, dude, what is Dinosaur Jr.? That band sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs>
And again, you know, it's like I, my ear was not developed at this stage for that music. And so um, I just quit playing drums uh, when I moved up here and then stumbled into meeting the other guys that ended up becoming Frodus. So Frodus was like my first band in high school when I, when I was here. And, so, and how did you and Shelby meet? Dude, this is really entertaining. So we moved, I moved to DC. My mom gets a part-time job, right? She's working for like the media duplication house for Fairfax County, meaning whatever, your high school, Reston High School needs a bunch of videos of some math tutorial for their classes. They put an order in and then they dial up and fabricate like five more videotapes to send to Reston and my mom worked in that office, right? Just totally random. My mom's a trained social worker and she was kind of over the social work world. And there was this older guy that was, he was probably a junior in college that was working with my mom. My mom was always like, oh, you need to meet Dan. Dan sounds like someone right up your alley. He's like, yeah, but does Dan like sheer terror? (laughs) Does Dan like youth of the day? Who is this guy? (laughs) And so I ended up going with my church to some youth group thing what was it called? I don't remember what it was called, but it was in Ocean City, Maryland. And there was like a, a band, quote unquote, that was playing at this event. And I ended up like kind of hanging out with them after one of like the Bible study things. And it was Shelby. And this guy there was another guy in the band named Dan, and I was like, oh, where are you guys from? Like, oh, you know, from Fairfax. I was like, dude, what? And this dude, Dan, was the guy my mom had been trying to introduce me to. <laughs> he just happened to be at the same thing. And then Shelby was really, it was like, you know, early Nirvana. This is 1993. And so, you know, Shelby had on a cardigan and like a curious George shirt and like beads and Long hair. This was like a, you know, grunge rock dude. But he had this list. We started hanging out. He had this list of records he wanted to buy. And one of them was like Biohazard, Urban Discipline. And I thought that was so amazing. And then they ended up needing a drummer. And so I had, I was going to. This is all true, and this is how the formation of Rotus happened. Uh, I had, like I said before, I had quit playing drums, and I got my car got hit and run, and I got all this insurance money, but my car drove fine. So I was like, "Oh, maybe I'll buy a new drum set." And my friend was going to sell me the larger half of like this huge nine-piece heavy metal drum set, right? So I had read in Modern Drummer magazine that to see if you're as good as a player, you have to videotape yourself. And so we couldn't find time for me to try out with this band that Shelby was doing. And so I had this random ass videotape of me playing the song Arise shirtless by Sepultura. And I just sent them the videotape. <laughs> so they were like, they were like, oh. yeah, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, they were like, they were like, yeah, remember that guy we met at that that like youth trip thing? He just sent us a video of him shirtless playing a that was her song. I think he should be in the band. <laughs> 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 and then you know, and then that's, I mean, that's how it started. That was that was spring of nineteen ninety three. And so, um, where did you guys go from there? Like, uh, where? Well, so at that at that point, like it was, you know, they, they like they had played a couple shows. It was not called Frodus. The band that band was called Limb Chip. And then what ended up happening was one guy lived, one guy in the band lived in, in Rockville, Maryland, 
and was older. And then there was the guitarist, Dan, who was older. And then Shelby and I were the same age. So so we were the youngest. And then we started just, like, stupid high school bickering inside of band practice. You know, like, Dan wanted to take the band one direction. And we were just like, we don't want to. You don't want to do that, you know? And and he ended up one day, like, getting really angry and leaving band practice. And then the three of us were by ourselves. And Jim had driven all the way to his parents' house from Rockville. And no joke, we wrote the first six Frodo songs in, like, an hour and a half. And that, I mean, and that, that was our first eighth and seven-inch. Boom. Like, we, were, we practiced six times. We were going to do a, a a show. Jim was going away to college, and we set up this huge, which is a whole other crazy adventure. We set up this kind of show under false pretenses at, at, at uh, West Springfield High School, and right before we played, the um, someone pulled the fire alarm. Mm. And we never got, and we never got to play. And so that sucks. Yeah, it totally sucks. But this is, I mean, but this is how the band actually started. So what happened was we we had these six songs, and then that was it. The band was over. And so one of Shelby's older brother's friends was like, hey, you guys should go record your set. And like, we're like, what do you mean? Like, you should go to a recording studio and, and document this. And we thought it was insane. She's like, you should go to WGNS Studios, which was... Jeff Turner from Grey Matter and Charles Bennington from the High Back Chairs. And we're like, okay, sure. So we went and just recorded our set list. And then Jeff and Charles were the ones that were like, what are you guys going to do with this recording? We're like, nothing. <laughs> this was, we were supposed to play at Charlie's High School, and someone pulled a fire alarm. So we just wanted to record the songs that we wrote before Jim goes away to college. And they're like, you should put this out. She's like, what do you mean? Like, you should make this on a record. I was like, what? I was like, oh, my God, the guy from Green Matter thinks we should make a record. This is amazing. And then, you know, it just kind of changed my mental state. And then we're like, okay, maybe we will be a band. And then we have to find a bass player. And everything's just – and that's – I mean, that's basically how it started. Well, isn't that also the story of the band, we have to find a bass player? <laughs> yes, and then that moment defined the rest of my professional life up until up until to this very day. <laughs> For some reason, I always have issues with bass players. Uh, you're it's not, not a... fun, man. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> that, that that happens to the best of us, and then you know, some of us wind up playing bass because we can't find a bass player. You know, it's like, screw it. We, somebody. Well, right. well. The, I, like the last incarnation of Furnace that was like the last couple of years was, that's exactly what happened. Like Nathan Burke, who was in the band Real Cool Rain, who was like way more pro than we were at the time. Um, he, we were like, we tried to get him in the band in 94, and he was going away to college again in Scotland or something. And then he came home, and we're like, hey, you know, we just came back from our first European tour, and we really need a bass player. Like, do you want to try again? Like, you're home. Why not? And he was like, okay, let's do it. And that, you know, that was the last bass player of Frodus, officially.
but including all that, there was 11 people. <laughs> when, when you guys recorded that first um, demo, yeah, uh, I mean, I know uh, Jim was going away, but, I mean, was there a thought that you and Shelby, like, that there was something really good there that, you know... Well, Jim, I mean, Jim was kind of the linchpin, to be honest. Like, I mean, he was in, like, I think he was in, he was in, like, a symptom. Like, he, he, is, he is an unbelievably professional musician, you know? And we were like, okay, like, the three of us just wrote all these songs without, uh, you know, it just happens, like, really quick. And so the idea of us doing that without Jim getting into our heads, you know, and just hey, you should you should do this. And then we wrote the song like off of the the Molotov cocktail party, our first record or paper, whatever you want to call it, had the song Business Creep on it. But we actually recorded a version of it for the seven inch with at WGNS. And so when they kind of convinced us, Shelby and I were like, oh, we actually have a song that we didn't really do a good version of. I was like, maybe we could write some more stuff. And then decided to kind of keep it going and have a friend of ours named Kyle come and play with us. And, you know, just that's how it kind of – it went from being like, oh, here's a seven-inch or here's a tape to maybe we could actually write more songs. And then the same thing happened. Like, Jim came home for, for winter break. I think we practiced, like, maybe six or seven times, then wrote all of Molotov Cocktail Party and went and recorded that. And what were, like, what what was the, the, the big song for you guys during that time? Like, what was Oh, uh, dude, dude, 100% Sasquatch. <laughs> it was... A completely satirical song written about a Sasquatch shopping at a mall. <laughs> and, I mean, to this day, you know, people are like, dude, Sasquatch, man, that was awesome. <laughs> but I was like, but did you get into the later material that was a little bit more serious? <laughs> Imagine me at, at 17, no filter, no understanding of toning it down. And so the music, like, the music essentially was all, like, I'm, I'm not a lyric guy, meaning unless it was, like, blatant Satanism and I felt it, like, was against my moral upbringing, I, I didn't care what anyone was saying, you know? But, but Sepultura was fine. 
Yeah, I mean, there's mostly just like guest lyrics, but like, like, uh, Morbid Angel was straight up, or like, deicide. That are just like, about Satanism. You know? Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, it's like, and all, like, you know, that was like me being rebellious inside the confines of like, uh, my parents were not strict, but like, a, a very conservative Southern Baptist upbringing, you know? Well, yeah. How how did your dad react to what you were doing? Well, I mean, like I played like I wanted to play drums my whole life, you know, and you know I I got a drum set when I was in fifth grade or sixth grade or something, and then you know then we moved up here and I started playing music, and you know even even if you don't like the music, there's no denying that it was like. It wasn't just like us in the garage doing something that sounded kind of bad. Like Jim was in an orchestra, and we could literally, you know, be like, was just an amazing bass player, and brought that, and then we would practice at my parents' house. It was like there was obviously tension when decision time came between higher education or being in a band, and you know, I went to Nova to basically stay in Northern Virginia Community College to stay on my mom's and my parents' insurance. But then the second semester of college, you know, I booked for Otis every weekend shows all up and down the East Coast. And it was ridiculous. You know, we'd put, drive, you know, eight and a half hours to play some show in the middle of nowhere in Connecticut for like 50 bucks to then turn around and come home. You know, like, but every weekend, every weekend, every weekend. And then, you know, I, I had to teach our, like, I had to teach myself how to book these tours. And so, you know, Discord was really amazing and would give you a list. But I booked a really solid 10 day tour for us in 1995. And since I couldn't fill one date, I only had nine shows. I canceled the whole thing because I thought I had failed. <laughs> and they were like legit shows too. And so, you know, and then, you know, things kind of progressed. And then I learned like, no, like nine shows in two days are actually good. <laughs> and just because you don't have one doesn't mean that you failed as a as a booking agent. <laughs> you know. Well- Considering the fact that you were willing to drive all the way to Connecticut for one show, not, <laughs> you know, not but, having right. a have But that was the plan. It was like, okay, we've got this one show. It's Frodus and the Crown Hate Ruin in this band Cable uh, in uh, this place called Studio 150, 138 on our studio phone. And to this day, there's like, you know, I met a handful of people at that show, but I still know. And that's the thing that I've always kind of has been amazed, amazing to me, like, this many years later. Is, you know, the people that you meet during those times are, you know, they're still in music. They'll run into people, and people are still around. Well, in, in terms of the shows that you played in the, the Northern Virginia area, and with... Yeah. The, and with other like Northern Virginia bands, um, what were like what were the places that you remember playing? In- oh, there was only one place, dude. One place, the music store, <laughs> out out in Chantilly. You know, like I'm, I mean, if you interview Bubble Jug, like I mean, that was our spot. It was you know, it was like this weird guitar store. Run by like a like Manassas guy that was always in the overalls and named Johnny Ray and just would let whatever happen there. He was always hammered. But we did so many shows there. So what was what was uh, it like playing there? Like what was the sound like? What was the crowd? Like? I mean, it was you know it was basically a box. It was just a box. And, like, you know, you you don't think about it when it's happening, but there's a a ton of kids at those shows. 200, 300 kids most of the time. 
you know? Like, it was kind of cavernous, but that was, like, the scene. And people would come and hang out, and people would be hanging out outside, and people would be inside. And Johnny Ray was there. Like, you couldn't tell if he was, if you just assumed he was drunk. But he wasn't belligerent. And I couldn't even tell you. Like, I think the bubble drug people are the ones that got that trophy. I, from my recollection, but I, I really don't remember. Yeah, um, and I think that they said that they were sort of amazed when they stumbled upon it. Like, yeah, like, like it was like this weird warehouse on Sullyfield like, Circle, right by Dallas well, Airport. Maybe looking at instruments, and there was like nothing there, but then they saw the back room, and they were just like asking him about what, you know, could, could they play there? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Why not? Go for it. <laughs> and so it was uh actually not not just not just there. I mean Jason Yawn, uh from you know, back then as as it was he was in Turbine, we used to do shows at his dad's church in Unadale, First Baptist Church in Unadale. And we did some really big shows there which was wild. Like, it was like Frodis, uh, it was the very, very first Darkest Hour show, um, like, maybe Jarhead, which was like a couple of local bands, but there was like almost 800 people at that show. It was insane. You know? Like, this is probably like 96? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy when I get like, you know, 20, 25 people out of my shows, like imagining being a a kid in high school or whatever and 800 people, 800 kids show up to my show. Nuts. Yeah, it's totally insane. I mean, you know, and and things seem to have changed, you know, <laughs> like you, almost no one gets that many people out now, you know, but, but like, yeah, I mean, it was a pretty... It, it, you know, thinking about it in retrospect and then comparing comparatively to now, like going to shows now or being in a band and playing shows now, like, yeah, I mean, the 50 people are around, let alone 700, you know? And, and what were you guys doing? Like, how were you going about promoting your shows, promoting... Flyers. Trying Just flyers. Man, flyers, like, Shelby and I would go out all the time. We'd pass flyers out everywhere. We'd put posters up everywhere. We would, so, I mean, so, so we, you know, we would just be every, go out all the time, you know? And it was, you know, looking back, it's all really interesting. Like, in the grand scheme of what, you know, like the arc of DC music, you know, Proto started in 93, but really started to play out in 94. And that's the era of when Shudder to Think and Jawbox are on their major labels. And so Zavi's like after crowning hugeness. And, you know, we, I'm like, I'm super persistent. And I would just call the Black Cat all the time for, for us to play, all the time. And at that point, Chris Thompson was our clubist. Uh, was the booking intern, which I thought was like the coolest thing ever. It was like, dude, the guy from Circus Lupus called me. <laughs> he answered the phone at the Black Cat. It's amazing, you know. Yeah. And then, then when when these people started to hear about the uh, size of the Frodo shows in Northern Virginia, then they started to give us shows, you know. And so. Um, and that's kind of how things kind of transferred from being like just in Northern Virginia out into to the world. <laughs> but a lot of it was just like me like persisting, like just calling all the time. And, you know, like some people would probably call it annoying, but, but it, you know, it wasn't me like pulling on someone's shirt coattails, like, hey, you know, we've got these shows around town, could we so we do one the black cat and then um and then they agreed and then you know people came and that's just kind of kind of kept escalating. 
Did you play? Uh, did you play the, the old nine thirty? Did you play? Yeah, we did actually. We we that was one of my favorite DC shows of all time. It was on the because remember they had it downstairs too. On the the top like main stage, it was Frodis, Pitchblend, and Candy Machine from Baltimore. And then downstairs was the band Branch Manager that had just signed the Discord. And, <laughs> and you know, we were on. And we were on the main stage, and I, I don't even think we played first. I think we played second or something. I, I, don't quote me on that. Um, but um, I was really nervous because I was like, dude, like this is the 930 club. This is crazy. And um, I remember looking, like opening the door and looking out to see if anyone was there, and there was a line down the sidewalk. Not a big one, but there was a lot. <laughs> there was enough people to make a line. And I thought that was, like, the craziest, most amazing thing ever. And that show was really, really, it was a great show. Totally packed out. There's tons of people at the 930 Club. And um, it kind of felt like, because all those guys are older, you know? Like, like, like we got a chance. You know, we were like younger kids, and we got a chance. And and was, was given a chance. And... and Pulled it off, or what? Yeah, well, what, however you want to describe it, but um, yeah. So you know, we didn't play into the like DC space or any of these other kind of legendary places, you know. But um, we did get to play the old Nine Thirty Club. I tried. I tried to get us to play at the Black Cat next week, but Dante called me to see if Rodas would play at the 25th anniversary of the Black Cat, and I. We were really trying to make it happen, but with Shelby in Sweden and Nathan in Seattle in life, we just couldn't, could not pull it off. So you guys are, um, you and Shelby are definitely still in touch and on good terms. Yeah, I mean, like, for the most part, it's like we don't talk all the time. And we're on pretty good terms, but it's not like... We're not, I mean, we don't live next to each other and we don't play music with each other. And we're not, like, super tight like we used to be. But there's no, like, bad blood or anything like that. It's just, like, life and circumstance, essentially. And and you're definitely, like, open, like you said, to if he, if he was in the States and there was something, you know. That... Yeah. And, like, we, we, I mean, we did play some shows. Nine years ago, and that was awesome. That was really fun, and um, I think that kind of satisfies that era for Shelby. Unfortunately, they did not do it with Nathan, and I I wish that that I wish that Frodis could play one last show with Nathan. I think that would be incredible, but I don't know if that would ever happen at this point in life. Well, so long as you guys are still alive, it can still happen. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's always, there's always a chance. Yeah. Um, so what, what, um, was kind of like, what, what was the peak of the band after that? And what was, you know, sort of like how how did the band come to a close? Well, in, in like spring of '95, that is when we really started to do it. Like, okay, we are going to tour. Like, it is happening. And then fall of '95 was when I got asked to join Battery, which had just made the decision to really be an active fan as well. Yeah. 
And so I would say the peak era of Frodis was probably 97 and 98. And that is after, you know, we did our first record F letter and that's when we started to kind of go out and tour. But then when we wrote and toured on Conglomerate International was when I would definitely call that like the high of And, you know, we toured the most in 1998 and that's when, you know, we had this like world tour plan with Refused and we toured Scandinavia with them and then we brought them here and they broke up and then, you know, our band broke up, you know. And you were playing in both bands at that time? I was playing in Battery and Florida simultaneously, yeah. So, I would, you know, the Battery would go on tour, then I would come home, and then Florida would go on tour. And then first would write a record, and then Battery would write a record. And, how, uh, how did you physically pull that off? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm an enthusiastic man. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we didn't tour together. Like, it wasn't like... There was only one time where Frodis and Battery, Frodis and Battery did three overlapping shows, and that was actually in Scandinavia with Refused. And then we did one show at no at uh, First Baptist Bannondale actually, um, where I I played two sets, and we had like two more, so I could have some some active recovery in between. Sets. I, uh, that's just, that sounds very physically and mentally draining. I mean, I think it was, but, you know, that's... I mean, that's the point for me, you know, yeah. like... Uh, you were young. You didn't know anything. Well, I mean, I still, I still operate the same, where it's like, how do we push the envelope exact? You know, like, that was, I mean, that was kind of the, the impetus for the band, was how do we explore and play music at the same time? And that's how I started to kind of book tours like it's the adventure of like dude let's go let's go for three months straight <laughs> you know like let's go like you know most people if they play three and they play like three shows we played 27 shows in different towns in 27 different places you know with receivers with like the biggest hardcore band from from Sweden and it was a really <laughs> interesting what I said, you played so much, Shelby decided to stay. <laughs> exactly. Like, we would, like, Frodo's, like, most people would fly into Germany for their tours, but we would fly into Sweden. And I'd say, we did it twice. Like, we did two European tours, you know? And then it kept, you know, then you do a European tour, and then, you know, then the, the goal changes to something else. Like, oh, we did Europe, you know, next is Japan. Next. Then when we broke up, I was trying to book us in, in Antarctica. <laughs> For real, you know, That's like, possible. Is, is, is that possible? Well, the, do you remember DSI Records, John Fox, season band United Mutation? They're like Arlington band. His brother is a scientist in Antarctica, and um, they, he did like a collection of local music at one point, and so. I was like, well, they got our CD in some, like, scientist station. And since we were so, like, into science and all that stuff, like, lyrically with the band, like, that'd be incredible if we would just play to some, like, <laughs> science station. Yeah, no, it fits for sure. It totally and seems so, like something you guys would do. And it was just kind of like, it didn't matter. If, like, it was, it was like... It would be amazing if we did that and there was like 20 scientists and we were just like in some weird bunker somewhere. Yeah. Know, with some like, like, like fuck Pink Floyd at Pompeii. <laughs> Here's Fronis at a science research facility at the bottom of the world. Thank you all 15 of you for coming out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so speaking of like Fronis in terms of as like uh, an idea or a movement kind of trying to, uh, I don't even know what to say, like represent or or be or uh, accomplish with the band. Maybe you can sort of explain that 
because I'm I'm fumbling with it. Well, I mean, it, there was not some unified front on what you know, what was the goal or what was the point or anything like that. Like it was a it was a pretty supportive environment, you know, like. Shelby has a really specific way of playing guitar, and I have a like a pretty specific way of playing drums, and it works between the two of us. And then you add a third member, and that's where it gets kind of hard because it's like, well, no, I mean, the, the, the subversive messages of the well, so 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 as I mean, this is, and I was kind of that is where the third member comes in. You know, like, and so over the the course of time, we had these like kind of like the, the the kind of submersive message that originally started was definitely Shelby and Jim. You know, mostly Jim, and then Shelby got on board. You know, and then things just kind of kept elevating, and it was just, you know, part of it was was real. Like, you know, we did kind of fuel into conspiracy theories, and Shelby was heavily involved in, like, the underground computer world and hacking, and there was, like, this whole scenario, like, these group of people that would meet in Pentagon City that were kind of hackers that we used to go to. I don't remember much about it, other than it was just not my scene, <laughs> but I was there regardless, you know? Um, and then it just kind of kept evolving, uh, like, on the the first seven inch we did with Howard Pyle as our bass player. This is kind of when it became pretty full time. Like that was a seven inch on Love It Records and then Shoot Records, which was uh John Davis from Corn and Cuban Not You. Um we just we developed this thing called the SL Pro to Sound Laboratories and it's like this whole kind of manifesto about sound and in, in being a laboratory and we well, we worked out this kind of like science edge to it. It was just like a fun alter reality, and then part of it was also fueled with, you know, by curiosity and then some, you know, theories and things like that. And then as the band kind of matured, then so did, you know, so did lyrics and interests and everything else. It's kind of this unified theme of, you know, what else is happening, and I kind of. I think came to its head with the conglomerate international record. And like most of that, like I was not, I was along for the ride for a lot of that stuff. And then I would agree or disagree, but almost never disagree. Like if the guy's cool, it's fine. You know? Yeah. Well, it seems like, you know, for a lot of it, it's sort of a, a goof for you, you know, it's part of like the, the, the fun of, of joking around and, Kind of fucking yeah, 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 totally. You know, like we, I mean, and that's the thing too, like, you know, like, and that's what I think is, is kind of the hallmark of, of being in a, in a supportive band. It's like, you know, I learned so much from Shelby, 
so much music, like stupid like stuff that I never, ever, ever would have given a chance. I learned from him. That I listen to to this day. Martin Denny is one of them. <laughs> the last, the kind of like lounge guy. Like I love that stuff, you know. And then I would hope or think that I did things that rubbed off on all of the other guys too. And like we really, you know, learned from each other and grew as a unit until it, you know, just like with any relationship, if you don't have the tools to maintain to express, then, then things can fall apart. And that, you know, definitely happened at the end where we just toured all the time and things just started to wear each other, you know? When you were working on the last album, did you know that that was going to be it? No. Like, there was some pretty serious tragedy around that last record. Like, my girlfriend that I've been dating for several years, she came down with a, she came down with terminal cancer. This is all in one week. This is June of 1999. Alana, was my girlfriend, got diagnosed with like absolutely no way to get better, like full-blown terminal cancer. Three days later, Shelby's dad got a car wreck and went half paralyzed. And then Nathan was in, uh, doing like a, visiting a friend over in Glasgow where he went to college, visiting his girlfriend and finds out his girlfriend is cheating on him with someone else. So he gets over there, he's out of a relationship, calls, upset. It's like, well, Alana's fucking dying and Shelby's dad can't move anymore. It's like, and that set the tone for us recording the record and writing it. We wrote a bunch of songs after hearing all that. Well, so there's a lot of dealing with grief. Yeah, there's like a lot of grief on there. And, and, you know, the what pretty much led to the band's demise was Nathan and Shelby wanted me to, like, focus. Not what led to the demise, but what, like, ended it, what, like, actually stopped the band was they felt that, like, I was going to be concentrating too much on band stuff as opposed to really dealing with my girlfriend. And which was inaccurate, and it was just, you know, a lot of times it's easier to just stop than it is to, like, try to sort it out. And so that's what ended up happening. They basically decided in uh, December of 99 that it was, like, everything was just too much. They have had enough, and and the band was going to be done. And I, you know, I didn't really have any have any say in it. But they were trying to support you in a way, I guess. I mean, theoretically, you know, like, and that's where, and you know, that's kind of where the where it comes in. Where it says, yeah, it was it was vo- voiced as such, but you know, obviously other things leading to those decisions. Is it, is it hard for you to listen to that music, even today? Um, it's not hard. It's, you know, it's kind of a listening song. Um, I'm proud of that record, you know? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad we wrote those songs, you know? Like, it, it served a time in the, I say it served a time and a place, I mean that, like, that is the sound of, us transitioning out of like full blown silliness and just dealing with like being adult. And it sucks. <laughs> you know? Like it was really hard. And like and I go to see my therapy and then I show up and submit. You know? And so it was just you know, it was it's difficult.
there's one song on that record about that month called 699, about June of 1999. And that can be hard to listen to, depending on my mood. And so, um, how, how long was it before you were, you know, ready to start playing again with other people and join us? Well, I mean, so, I mean, I, we had become friends with uh, a bunch of bands, you know, from touring all over, and I really, really wanted to be in a fast grindcore band, and we got close with a band from Florida called Reversal Man, and they kind of ended up breaking up and, and, and kind of morphing and with this other band called Combo Uno Veteran. So right as Brodus broke up, I had been talking to them about recording some songs with them. So I went directly into Combo Uno Veteran from Brodus. <laughs> And, um, like, first broke up in, like, December, like, December 28th, 2009. And then I was in Florida in February, early February, recording AP with Combat. And, I, I mean, I've looked through your credits. Your credits are just insane. You know, you <laughs> know. <laughs> what, do, what do you mean? I mean, well, you you played with a lot of bands and recorded a lot of music since since Brodus. I mean, it seems like you have just you know been been constantly uh, playing and recording. I mean, Frodus is you know we were acting and we liked it. We we wrote songs pretty quickly, pretty good, and, and then um. You know, it's like things, like my argument was like, look, you know, we don't know what's happening with my girlfriend. Like, let's take a six month break and then see what's up. And instead of just like totally ending the band. And then, you know, the other guys disagreed with that and they were like, no, let's just, let's just end it. Like, we're tired of doing this. I was like, okay, you know, whatever. I can, you know, I, I've got no thing. Um, but I was still, you know, I still wanted to be in a band. Like, I, I was not at the point of being like, okay, I give up. I'm not going to be in a band anymore, you know? And at the time, I could, you know, we could kind of sense that things were kind of going away, but not, I never thought it would be over, honestly, you know? It's like one of those things, like, you know, yeah, things are kind of rough, but we'll get, we'll deal with it. We'll get through it. And um, my girlfriend was getting treatment in Boston at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and the band Converge had lost their drummer. And so there was a discussion about if I wanted to be in Converge, and because they were writing that record to Zero. And like, I remember very specifically, I was in every visit every doctor's appointment for when my girlfriend was sick, every single one of them. And these these visits at Dana Farber would take forever. They I mean, they take hours. And so she'd go and get treatment and scans and all kinds of stuff. And so I was like, hey, let me jump out. I go talk to the guys from Converge. And she had, you know, met all these people at the, at the stage. She's like, okay, you know, I'll be here. And I remember being on the phone. It was with uh, the guitarist, Kurt, and singer, singer Jake, and I was just like, "Look, you know, if my girlfriend passes away, I'm sure I'll be able to do this. And if she doesn't, I have no idea." And they were just like, "That is the most insane. Like, that is way too heavy for with or for us to deal with." I, yeah. I agree. I think I'm just letting you know. Like, that's the reality of your your life and your situation. 
yeah, you know, and so it was just one of those things, man, you know, like I I didn't know and like and and so you know, pro this ends and then I ended up joining combat owner veteran and people would ask me to play drums on tour and I would never want to do it. And I, I did play drums on one tour as well as we could clean I mean toured the Holy Land. We took England and Israel and England and the UK and that was right after this as well. And then like, you know, like six months later, literally six months later, uh Shelby called and asked if I'd want to practice. And I was like, I was enraged. I was like, what do you mean do I want to practice? And I was like, dude, you like you don't want to play music. He said, Well I think I'm ready. I was like so you would want to do the six month break that I suggested? I'm like, what the hell? I said, no. <laughs> you know? And then there's no, you know, it, it took a, it took a little bit and then he and I started jamming. Like and then I started traveling all over the world. And then he and I started jamming again and that's what then turned into the Black Sea and Decahedra. And that was like throw to take two. But, I mean, something different. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was like, it was like, you know, it was Frodus with the bass player from Fugazi. Like, we can't call that Frodus. <laughs> this is, this is something else. This is absolutely insane. Like, let's, let's figure a different band name. Um, you know, like, that's kind of like a more, I mean, it sounds pretty similar to Furious. It's just a little bit more of a different. You know, it's clearly where it's a clearly a different time and place. And your and your um, penetrate self would have been really mad at you. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I mean, you know, it's like it's you know, anytime you're, you're exposed to, and like for me, when I'm exposed to a new idea uh, or to a new music. Uh, it takes me a little bit. And it, it took me, I will never forget, I was at the used record store in Florida, and I bought three seven inches because I thought they looked cool. One was Mud Honey. Two was Rice of Spring. Three was Nirvana. Nirvana Slivers, like this clear colored seven inch. It was a sunflower seven inch. Bought all three, returned all three. I was like, I don't like any of these. This is all terrible. <laughs> And the guy just thought it was hilarious. And I was like, I don't like, I was like, I don't get this. I was like, can I get the Judge and Inside Out Records instead? <laughs> and it was just, you know, like time and place, like where you're at. And so it's taken me, you know, it took me a while to kind of appreciate and understand where all that stuff is 
you know, but where the mid era of DC was coming from. And of course, you know, like, I love it to death. Um, so I would be remiss if I wasn't to ask you about um, some of the stuff you're doing musically now with like the uh, with with music preservation in Syria. Oh yeah. And cause that seems to be a complete left turn. Uh, <laughs> Wait, hold on. I was I was just doing an illegal U turn <laughs> in front of the cops, and this this is, police officer was just staring at me and said, "Hey, I need to get by." And graciously, this woman just pointed to the no U turn sign and just told me to keep driving. Yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, that's funny. Well, okay, now what, what about my Syria? What about the Syria stuff? Uh, I was just saying it seems it seems completely like abstract and it seems completely something different. But uh, I would love to hear. I mean, it you. is it is what it is. It because yeah. it, every skill that I learned booking tours. Oh. Like I have to cold call in. You know, like. I've been working on that for like 13 years now, but it's like all these different things, all these like kind of figuring out going to exotic places. And this is like a complete simplified version of the rest of the But that's like the excitement of trying to pull something off of like going to somewhere new and exciting. It's still music related. It's culture related. Um, there's a lot to be done around it, you know, like, I don't know. Yes, it's not, it's definitely not being in a band, but it's also a lot of the same infrastructure around being in a band is similar to this kind of larger scale Syria project. Without load in. <laughs> <laughs> With those who hike my drums up a bunch of stairs. Well, so how did you get into this? I mean, I, Jesse Heathrum broke up, and then the next night, I was just like, man, I want to do something that's completely different than what I'm normally doing. And the idea was to form an orchestra, like to form a rock, for lack of a better term, and um, score music. And so I kind of stumbled into it that way. Um, and that's like a highly simplified version of, of what happened. But so it, it turned the, out like... Through the, the Syrian culture? Like, wait, what, what now? Okay. Oh, no, no, no. So, so the actual moment really started. And I was driving and I had bad cell phone coverage. And my friend Bill was like, yo, man, I found these rad chains from Serbia. And I was like, man, I never got to go to Syria. That sounds amazing. He's like, no, Serbia. But like, I know. I was so close on that good clean fun tour. <laughs> and and I just misheard him. Honestly. I just misheard him. And it sparked all these memories of all these other of this book I had read where this guy allegedly has found the world's oldest Christian music in a church. Or, or, or I remembered it wrong, like in a monastery in the desert of Syria, and I was like, dude, I'm going to go find that stuff. And, you know, 13 years later, like, I recorded it <laughs> in partnership with the Smithsonian Institute. And just this week, this is really exciting. You know that band Sleep? Yeah, yeah. So the original guitarist of Sleep and I are actually finally scoring the chant. I sent them stuff earlier this week, and so we're actually going to write some music for these chants that I ended up recording. That's awesome. I'm so psyched. Well, so how did you record them? Well, let me, let's do this, dude. Let's part two. Let's not walk into a meeting in five minutes. <laughs> All right, because it does seem like... One, we're going way afield of Northern Virginia, and two, this this is fascinating, and I would love to hear more about this. Yeah, like, I, I mean, 
When you're like, yeah, let's talk for an hour. I was like, there's no possible way we're going to talk for an hour. <laughs> I was like, I've never done an hour interview ever. <laughs> All right. Well, dude, I did so. I can tell so I did the, I got so far and turned it into into an hour first episode for sure. <laughs> All right. All right. Good.